Hey guys, it's Medicosis Perfectionalis, the Uber of medical education. Let's continue our labs playlist. In the previous video, I've talked about anti-intrinsic factor antibodies. Today, it's time for anti-parietal cell antibodies seen in patients with pernicious anemia, atrophic gastritis, gastric cancer, and others. With that said, now let's get started. Please watch my video called Vitamin B12 in my biochemistry playlist and the intrinsic factor antibodies video in my labs playlist. So here is the story of vitamin B12 metabolism. You eat a source of vitamin B12. Cool. Now this vitamin B12 is bound to an animal protein. Okay, now we gotta get rid of this animal protein and leave the vitamin B12 free. Okay, who's gonna break that bond? Amylase. That's an enzyme coming from your salivary glands. Okay, now your vitamin B12 is free. Free to do what? Uh, well, it's free to bind to something else. What's that called? R protein. Where does it come from? the same salivary glands. But now we cannot absorb vitamin B12 when it's bound to the R protein. Okay, let's sever this relationship. Now this is the job of pancreatic amylase. Vitamin B12 is now free to bind to the intrinsic factor. And this intrinsic factor is gonna help your vitamin B12 get absorbed at the terminal ileum. Okay, who made this intrinsic factor? Your parietal cells, aka axintic cells. Axintic means acidic because they secrete acid, cold. HCl, hydrochloric acid, baby. Okay, and these cells are mostly in the cardiac fundus, maybe sometimes in the antrum, but they are not in the pylorus. So, in a nutshell, intrinsic factor comes from your parietal cells in your stomach. And this intrinsic factor is gonna help your vitamin B12 get absorbed. Now, people with pernicious anemia have antibodies, and these antibodies are nasty. They are attacking the intrinsic factor called anti-intrinsic factor antibodies, or they are attacking the parietal cells called anti parietal cell antibodies and this is the topic of today's video in pernicious anemia you have antibodies attacking your lovely stomach parietal cells and your intrinsic factor as a result you will develop vitamin b12 deficiency with megaloblastic anemia and neurological symptoms let's do some housekeeping iron folate and cobalamin where does iron get absorbed uh, in the duodenum how about folate gets absorbed in the jejunum cobalamin terminal idiom how do i remember them thank you ellie so first you iron your clothes then you fold them later you put them in the closet oh so iron first folate second and cobalamin third in pernicious anemia, you can have anti-intrinsic factor antibody or anti-parietal cell antibody or both. If I have vitamin B12 deficiency, I will not be able to make DNA, therefore my cells will not divide. My red blood cells will be big, immature and stupid because there is no cell division and there is no maturation because there is no DNA synthesis because I have B12 deficiency. We divide anemia into microcytic, normocytic, and macrocytic. Based on what? Based on the MCV, mean corpuscular volume. If it's 80 to 100, that's normal, we call it normocytic or normal size. Less than 80, that's a small cell called microcytic. More than 100, this is macrocytic. B12 deficiency causes macrocytic anemia. Macrocytic anemia, you divide them into megaloblastic and non-megaloblastic. The megaloblastic caused by folate deficiency or B12 deficiency. Non-megaloblastic, on the other hand, caused by liver disease, alcohol or drugs. Normally, normally, your red blood cells start as immature called blasts. And as they mature, they get smaller and smaller and smaller until you end up with sites called erythrocytes or red blood cells. So normally we go from bigger to smaller. And of course, in order to do this, we need what? Cell division. Oh, therefore you need some DNA synthesis. No kidding. But if I have B12 deficiency, DNA synthesis is toast. And that's why my red blood cell will stuck in the immature phases, we call them big blasts. But not just the red blood cells, also with the myeloblast or neutrophils and with the megakaryocytes as well. Everything is giant, everything is immature, everything is stupid. This is the story of megaloblastic anemia. Pernicious anemia. I could have anti-intrinsic factor antibody type 1 or anti-intrinsic factor antibody type 2. Watch my last video to know more. Or you can have anti-parietal cell antibodies. Tell me more about the anti-parietal cell antibodies. They are present in about 90% of patients with pernicious anemia. 
Also, they can be present in atrophic gastritis or gastric cancer. The older you get, the more antiparietal cell antibodies you're more likely to have. About 10% of the normal population have positive antiparietal cell antibodies. In other words, just because you happen to have positive antiparietal cell antibodies doesn't necessarily mean that you suffer from pernicious anemia. And that's why always remember, treat the patient, not the lab results, you doofus. These antiparietal cell antibodies can cause destruction to the gastric mucosa, no kidding, and you measure them by indirect immunofluorescence. Antiparietal cell antibodies are positive in cases of pernicious anemia, that's the most important one, and atrophic gastritis, gastric ulcer, gastric cancer, and some other autoimmune diseases, because remember, autoimmune diseases are like birds of feather, they flock together. If I have pernicious anemia, an autoimmune disease, I'm more likely to have another autoimmune disease when compared to the general population. So if I have this, I'm more likely to have this, 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 or this. These are autoimmune diseases, including Hashimoto thyroiditis, Addison disease, type 1 diabetes, and myxedema. If you notice, most of them are autoimmune diseases. Now, let me give you some tips and tricks. Remember when I told you that about 10% of the normal population have antiparietal cell antibodies in their serum? Yeah. By the way, this is more likely to happen if you happen to have a relative with pernicious anemia. Your cousin from Boston. Why am I doing this? Moreover, these antiparietal cell antibodies can cross-react with other antibodies, such as antithyroid antibodies and anticellular antibodies. But hey, medicosis, which uh, test tube should I use uh, in order to order the test of the antiparietal cell antibodies or anti-intrinsic factor antibodies? Well, use the red top tube. Okay, medicosis, um, 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 what kind of anticoagulant does this red top tube have? None. It does not have any anticoagulant. So, the blood is gonna clot? Oh, how did you figure this out, genius? And then what's gonna happen when the blood clots? Oh, the serum will separate. Yeah, blood will be at the bottom and serum at the top. And then take that serum, centrifugate it, and uh, measure those doozy antibodies. Gotcha. If I have a patient with pernicious anemia, uh, what kind of tests should I order? You can order the vitamin B12 level in the serum. You can order the MCV, hemoglobin, hematocrit, red blood cell count. You can order the methylmalonyl-CoA level. Or you can perform the Schilling test. This is an old archaic test. It can be useful sometimes. Especially if the antibody test is not available. If you like this video, you will love my antibiotics course. Go to medicosisperfectionalist.com to download it today. It has 40 videos, 70 questions, 35 cases with answers, my ultimate notebook, and a mind map. There is no subscription, you just download it once and keep it for you forever. You can also get my cardiac pharmacology course to learn about those anti-arrhythmics, anti-hyperlipidemics, anti-anginal, anti-hypertensives, diuretics, antidoxin, and others. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my premium courses. Thank you for watching as always. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense. I love you.